The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is the worst movie I've ever seen. I would rather roll around in the piss, blood, and vomit of an Ebola patient than ever watch this movie again. It is a mess! I was trying to piece together what the hell was happening. I was trying to find the point to certain subplots. I was trying to figure out if I was in the right theater. I saw the movie with two friends of mine and they had no idea what was going on either. We kept turning to each other like, What's the point of this scene? What's the point of this? What's the point of this character? What's the point of this subplot? No one in the audience had any idea what was happening. If you like this movie, fine. But it is a piece of shit. That is a fact. I've talked with the top doctors on the planet and they agree with me. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is a bad movie. It is a fact. It is on Wikipedia. That's how you know it's a fact. So let me quit my bitching and carefully explain why they- The tone. Same problem with the first movie. The first Spider-Man- far- sorry, the- The first amazing Spider-Man movie had an inconsistent tone. Some of it was dark, some of it was silly, some of it was funny. The movie didn't really know what the hell it wanted to be and it wound up being a mess. But I guess before they made the sequel, they went, uh, that tonal problem we had in the first movie? Let's amplify it. Let's take everything we did right and do it wrong. This movie has 20 different plots, none of which connect with each other, all of which are in a different genre. It is like watching eight movies in one movie. The transitions between scenes are so awkward because it feels like you're going from one movie to another movie. Let's discuss the 20 different plots this movie has. Movie one. This is the best movie within these eight movies. There are still some charming scenes between Gwen and Peter, but these scenes don't hold a candle to those in the original. Gwen and Peter had a real chemistry there. What kept me going in that first Amazing Spider-Man movie were those scenes. The scenes between Gwen and Peter. Those were actually pretty well done. In this movie, they suck! How is it these two have no chemistry? They're dating in real life! Maybe because the dialogue written for them is so bad and the actors just don't give a shit. I don't really know and I don't really care, but most of these scenes don't really work. They're still the best scenes in the movie, but that's not saying much. Movie 2. The Sam Raimi series did this really well. We see their relationship progress over the course of three films. In this movie, they rush it because they have to make room for the ten other movies within this one movie. We're introduced to to Harry out of nowhere. His father is dying, and then his father dies after delivering some cliche dialogue. How could you possibly understand that your childhood had to be sacrificed for something greater? Then Peter hears the news, and then we realize, like, wait, Peter and Harry know each other? How come this was never mentioned ever in the last movie? And so out of nowhere, we find out that these two have a long-lasting friendship. And they are there for each other whenever the going gets tough, apparently. But they just throw this friendship at us, and it was never introduced, ever! We never even heard a little bit about Harry in the last movie. Just all of a sudden, they're longtime friends? Where the hell did this come from? So then Harry's sick, so he wants Spider-Man's blood, because he thinks Spider-Man's blood will fix him. So he talks to Peter Parker like, like, hey, you know Spider-Man, don't you? You took a picture of him. You took his picture. So? You know him. WHO WROTE THIS SHIT?! And Peter Parker's like, sure, I'll go call him for you. And then Spider-Man shows up just to go, Sorry. You're a fraud, Spider-Man! <laughs> then Harry puts on the Green Goblin suit, turns in the Green Goblin, it looks like shit, and then they fight. And the point of that subplot was Gwen Stacy died? That was the point? Why couldn't Electro just kill Gwen Stacy? Why was this in the goddamn movie? Movie 3. Yeah, this movie has another villain, Electro. And I guess it has a third villain, Rhino. Three villains? Sure, why not? It worked so well the last time you did it! So Jamie Foxx plays this nerdy guy, and he likes Spider-Man, and then he falls into a vat of mutated electric eels, and he turns into Electro. Sure, I don't even care at this point. So then Electro goes to Times Square, and he sees himself on TV, and he's like, look, I'm famous. And then Spider-Man shows up, and, uh, I don't know, the, the, the camera turns to Spider-Man, and everyone starts booing at Electro, and that makes him mad. So then he wants to kill Spider-Man now? Why does he want to kill Spider-Man? Didn't he love Spider-Man? Is it because Spider-Man took away his fame? He saw himself on the screen for five seconds, and he thought he was famous. Wait, he didn't want to be famous, did he? And then Spider-Man shows up, and the cameras turn to him, and everyone starts cheering for him and not you, and you get mad at Spider-Man. Then Spider-Man fights you, and you get locked up. And now you want to kill Spider-Man, cuz... cuz... I'm gonna kill the light. Everyone in this city is gonna know how it feels to live in my world. A world without power. A world without mercy. A world without Spider-Man. 
so then of course Harry breaks him out and then what's his plan to, to, to do something with the electricity I will control everything and I will be like a god <laughs> movie number four this whole plot line is separate because it has nothing to do with anything else in the movie every scene between Aunt May and Peter Parker in this movie is pointless she has no impact on the plot at all this plot line doesn't even have a resolution to it they never resolve their financial issues well, i sold another another couple of photos to the bugle so that ought to help yeah it would really help if that guy would pay you a fair wage well james no james pays, pays me a fair wage if it was 1961 he paid me a fair wage wait 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 what are you doing what are you doing what are you doing no i do the I'm laundry i'm doing my laundry no i do the laundry this no, is no i my, know I'm, no I'm, this is my job i've been doing your laundry since you were six years old i understand right? that but, i'm okay. in college now i think I, it's time I, that i took I, care I, of my own dirty underwear I, I'm, last I'm, time you did the laundry you turned everything blue and red that so was a no. mistake yeah because i was washing the the the, the american flag my can I please no just- No one washes a flag. I do, you know and what? I won't anymore. Forget this it, fine. Can I just my do my- machine. It's just underwear. This is please. my laundry, my home, my machine. Back off. Eat your breakfast. All right, laundry sheriff. I'll do it later. I'll do it. No, Why is this in the oh. movie? Movie number five. This is another thing that is totally pointless. It's not like what he discovers in this plot line. He can apply to events that occur later in the film in a different plot line. And this plot is all over the place. It goes from being really dark to being really stupid. Peter Parker throws his calculator at the wall and finds tokens within his calculator. I guess Peter's father put them in there. So then he takes the coins and goes to a subway station and puts the coins in that thing over there. And then this happens. We're watching 10 different movies, none of which are connected, and none of which have the same tone. So we go from scenes like this... <laughs> ...to this! Mark Webb. Now, Mark Webb is a good director, and he's pretty much the only reason the last Spider-Man movie wasn't god-awful. Uh, really, at the end of the day, what was the access point for me was the was the characters. I wanted to build a movie on a foundation of, of, of you know, simple human relationships. But in this movie, I guess he just stopped caring, or he didn't know how to handle this material. Electro is one of the most cinematic villains that you can imagine because you know, he glows, he has the power of uh, electricity and... In my opinion, Mark Webb is a good romantic comedy director. He knows how to make a movie about two people falling in love really interesting. That was the best part of the last Spider-Man movie. But what he can't do is make a dark film or direct action or anything that was required of him. Stop it! Stop! Good! Good! Got it! Great! And I guess at some point he just stopped caring because he knew the movie would come out bad. And that's why every scene in this movie is bad. I could go down every scene in this movie and carefully explain why it's bad and what Mark Webb did wrong. We've um, used a radioactive isotope to genetically engineer these... these super spiders. Good! Good! Got it! Great! I'm not gonna do it with every scene, but I'm gonna do it with this one. The first scene of the movie. This scene is so bad, I could make a reason scene one of the Amazing Spider-Man 2 sucks video. But let's just talk about the directing. This scene isn't really necessary at all in the context of the movie, but it's a good way to set the tone. This scene could have been really suspenseful and very well done, but Mark Webb doesn't know how to direct a scene like this, so it came out like garbage. Now, to talk about a scene like this, I'm going to have to compare it to another scene. Another opening scene involving a bad guy coming into a good guy. Oh wait, I said that wrong. I'm going to compare this scene in The Amazing Spider-Man 2 to this scene from Inglorious Bastards. In the opening scene of Inglorious Bastards, a Nazi comes to a house because he knows Jews are there with the sole intent of killing all the Jews in the house, which are hiding under the floorboards. In this scene from The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Peter Parker's dad and mom are sitting in an airplane, and then a bad guy sneaks in to kill them. I'm going to explain why this scene is good and this scene is bad. Number one, the dialogue. The dialogue in this scene is rich and interesting, because Quentin Tarantino wrote it. We learn a lot about this character from this one scene, and as the scene goes on, we discover the intent of this character. And there is even some levity. That's how you write a scene. This scene sucks. The dialogue in this scene is cliche and bad. We're gonna be fine, Mary. Did you see his face? He's never gonna understand. 
Mary, we've been through this. Our life as we know it is over. We're gonna spend every day from now on looking over our shoulders. The pacing. This scene is perfectly paced. It's not too short where it's not intense, and it's also not too long to where you get bored. It is the perfect length. Information is doled out at a very good pace, and it keeps you interested in the scene. Now, my job dictates that I must have my men enter your home and conduct a thorough search before I can officially cross your family's name off my list. And if there are any irregularities to be found, rest assured they will be. That is unless you have something to tell me that makes the conducting of a search unnecessary. I might add also that any information that makes a performance of my duty easier will not be met with punishment. The pacing in this scene sucks. The scene is too short, so it doesn't have time to build up suspense. And every shot is too quick. It doesn't give you time to assess the scene or what's going on. It doesn't give you time to slow down and relax. So that when it's revealed that there is an assassin on the plane, you actually feel nervous. The performances. This one's pretty simple. The performances in this scene are good. The performances in this scene aren't good. Really, you two are never going to see your son again. You should be bawling. You should be crying your eyes out. But I guess that would require them to act. Why would they need to act? It's not like it's their job or anything. The music. Listen to the music in this scene. You're sheltering enemies of the state, are you not? Yes. You're sheltering them underneath your floorboards, aren't you? Yes. That's right, there is no music. The key to making a scene intense is quiet. Think of every intense scene you've ever seen. Nine times out of ten, it is quiet. Call it. Call it, yes. For a whole lot. Just call it. Well... We need to know what we're calling it for here. You need to call it. I can't call it for you. Well, it wouldn't be fair. I didn't put nothing up. Yes, you did. You've been putting it up your whole life. You just didn't know it. You know what date is on this coin? No. 1958. It's been traveling 22 years to get here. And now it's here. And it's either heads or tails. The only music used during this scene is at the end, when you know exactly what the outcome is. You know it is inevitable that the Jews are going to die, so the music slowly builds up to the point where the inevitable happens. And here In this scene, the music stinks. The music is playing over the whole scene, so you know something intense is bound to happen. And the music is just bad. It's the most standard stock action movie music. You can get this music off a website. <laughs> Overall direction. This scene is very well shot, very well lit very well acted, very well paced. The shot composition is beautiful, and every pan, zoom, and close-up has a meaning to it. This scene is quickly edited nonsense, with terrible music, acting, and staging. Just look at the camera here. It's shaking for absolutely no reason. The cameraman is literally standing there shaking the camera. It's not like the plane is crashing, right? It isn't. At least not at this point. At this point, the plane is on autopilot. Wait, it's on autopilot, right? It has to be, because the pilots are dead. But then the pilot leans forward on the throttle, and then the plane starts plummeting. So wait, it wasn't on autopilot? A dead pilot was flying the plane? What the hell was the assassin thinking? Before you kill the pilots, turn the thing on autopilot. This guy isn't a suicide bomber. He's an assassin hired by a corporation. He doesn't want to die. He's getting paid to do this. Why'd you even need to kill the pilots? Could have just shot these two in the back. What were the pilots gonna do? Stop you? They're too busy flying the plane. Anyway, back to the camera. So yeah, the camera's shaking for absolutely no reason. Whenever you do shaky cam, or as I like to call it, handheld camera, it's to give the illusion that the camera is a character in the film. Whenever a character is running, 
or jumping or fighting a war, the camera usually shakes to give you the sense that you're really there. It makes things more intense and gritty. Paul Greengrass does it all the time, but he doesn't shake the camera for no reason. It's usually because the cameraman is holding the camera, and whenever he has to move, the camera just naturally shakes. Paul Greengrass doesn't stand there with a camera and just shake it for no reason. It's only when a character is running, jumping, flying, crashing into something, driving, or just doing something that jolts you around. Did you know that, Mark Webb? Good, got it, got it, great, good. Mark Webb can't even direct extras. Electro is killing people, why are you standing there? Same thing at the end of the movie. Rhino is attacking police officers and everyone's just standing around watching. RUN! On 9-11, no one was looking at the buildings like, Oh, cool, look at that. They were running away! To hell with extras, he can't even direct actors anymore. This generic evil scientist is straight out of a cartoon. I'm here to study you, to understand what you are, why you are, and I will get results. He has asked me, to offer you a riddle. Fucking bread. Fiddle dee, fiddle dee dee, Mr. Rice. Name a fish with no legs that can, is electric and swims around under your feet. That's a tough one. What is it? It's an eel. You won again, Mr. Rice. And for some reason, every actor in the movie repeats everything twice. Peter? No. Peter? I gotta find my aunt. I gotta find my aunt. I don't know. It's, uh, I don't know. I break up with you. I break up with you. That's a question. That's a question. Did you tell the actors to do it or did you just leave it because you were like, oh, that's natural? Good, got, got it. Great. Uh, good. This movie's too long. This movie is two and a half hours and it feels like eight hours. That's because the pacing is bad and there are eight different plots that don't make any sense. This movie could have been cut down so much. If you cut out everything with Aunt May, which is pretty much filler, the movie would be shorter. If you cut out the first scene of the movie, which is completely pointless, the movie would be shorter. This scene doesn't even make sense. Who do you make this video for? It wasn't Peter. But as a father, it means I may not see my boy again. Nothing is as important to me as my son, Peter. This scene is just bad, not because of the reasons I mentioned before, but because it ruins the mystery. The whole movie, Peter's trying to find out what happened to his parents, but we know what happened to his parents. They died in a plane crash. Apparently there's stuff in this movie that they cut out. There's a whole subplot with Mary Jane Watson, played by Shailene Woodley. Like, really? There wasn't enough shit in this movie? You were gonna add a whole other subplot? Apparently they cut it out because the movie was already too long. And thank God. We're introducing so many new characters, it really didn't make sense to introduce such a vital character to the comic books in a movie that had so much else going on. So they're holding off for future films. But that being said, it is one of the best scripts I have ever read. And that's not a lie. I mean, for it to be a Spider-Man film and to have a script that- Squirrel! Has. But I think the reason they cut it out is because Shailene Woodley is a good actress and Mark Webb was like, this bitch cares about the story. Fire her! Good, got it, got it, great, uh, good. The music. I usually never criticize music. Cause I'm not a music critic, I'm a movie critic. Movie critics don't talk about music. Unless it sucks really bad or it's really great. So since I'm talking about the music, I want you to guess what I thought of it. Did I think it was amazing? As amazing as Spider-Man? Or do you think I hated it? If you guessed I thought it was amazing, then you can take my amazing f and shove it down your throat until you choke. This is the worst soundtrack I've heard in a long time. 50% of it sounds like stock music. 20% of it sounds like elevator music. 10% of it is pop songs that don't fit with the scene at all. And the rest of it's just like... Weird! I can't believe Hans Zimmer's name is on it. He must have- I don't know what the hell he was thinking. Did he actually have something to do with the soundtrack? Hans Zimmer is an amazing composer, and he's made some of the best, most iconic soundtracks in film history. Did he actually have something to do with the making of this soundtrack? He must have tripped and fell on a keyboard, and they went, Oh, that's good enough. I guess that'll be the soundtrack to our movie. Loved it.
Alright, I'm exaggerating a little. Hans Zimmer had something to do with the soundtrack, but he wasn't the composer. Yep, the real evil genius behind this soundtrack is Pharrell Williams. I wanna get that, isn't it clear we're here again, before it. The pop star, you know him, he wrote this song. After hearing that song, I was like, yep, he would be a great composer for a movie soundtrack. He definitely knows how to take a scene of two people murdering each other and add music to it. He's a renowned artist, right? Nope. He's another talentless pop star hack. And aside from his 2005 Best Dressed Man in the World award, his trophy case is empty. Did they really think he would be a good choice to do a movie soundtrack? Just listen to it. He takes action scenes and makes them into music videos. The music completely takes you out of the movie. Dude, if you could only imagine what Hans and I got to do musically, I'm telling you. Riveting? That's an understatement. Does your giant ego even fit in that giant hat of yours, you f***ing asshole? This movie isn't well written or funny on any level. Any human being capable of writing this line? It's my birthday. Now it's time for me to light my candles. Or this line? Be like a god to them. A god named Sparkles? And saying to themselves, oh, that's funny, should be thrown in a gas chamber. I showed this scene before, and this is a perfect example of how not to do comedy. First of all, the joke of this scene is stolen from the original Spider-Man movies. Except in that movie, it was a quick visual gag, and it was over with in five seconds. In this movie, it goes on for ten minutes. Do you want me to show the entire scene again? No? Is it because it's not funny? If it were funny, you would want me to show you it again, right? Here's the time code in case you want to go back to that scene and watch it all over again, because it was so funny. What's that? It isn't funny and it serves no purpose? You mean when Peter Parker said, All right, laundry sheriff. You didn't find that hysterical? So I am not against this movie having funny scenes. However, if the scenes are trying to be funny and fail horribly, then it just feels like padding. You're gonna take my car into the shop because it... Are you all right? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm just... I'm very naked right now. What happened to your face? It's filthy. It is? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, I was cleaning the chimney. That wasn't funny, therefore this scene serves no purpose, and it annoyed me. Same with this scene. Now, there's nothing to distract from your unibrow. There he is. There he is. <laughs> you still blow and dry your hair every morning? Um. You know, one of my manservants holds the hair dryer, but I work the comb. Okay, so at least I'm not completely helpless. <laughs> you want to know the only funny part? Here it is. Oh my God! I'm so damn it! I just spilled a hot latte all over your. I didn't do that. Oh, no. And you too. I'm sorry. Stay, stay right there. Hilarious. A movie that is four hours long made me laugh once. Thank God. Please take all my money. Product placement. Right off the bat, I want to say that I have no problem with product placement. If there's a struggling filmmaker trying to get financing for his film, and Coca Cola steps in and says, We'll give you money if you advertise our product. I have no problem with that. The fact of the matter is every movie ever has product placement in it. Even some of my favorite movies of all time have product placement. David Fincher movies have tons of product placement. You just don't care because the movie is so good. When you're focused on the story and the characters, you do not care about product placement. It goes right over your head. There is tons of product placement in 22 Jump Street. I saw the movie twice, and the second time I saw it, I realized how much product placement there was in it. How did I not notice that the first time? Is it because I didn't care because I was too busy laughing? Yep. Ads being added to a film in order to get it made is 
is much different than a movie being made so they can sell ads. That is what The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is doing. This is not a movie. It's one big advertisement. You don't believe me? Luckily, I watched the entire movie and noted whenever there was product placement. Here we go. If I left out any product placement, please let me know. Because there is so much product placement in this movie, I doubt I got it all. Leave it in the comments section if I forgot any. One more thing I'd like to mention before part one is over, is that every computer in the movie is Sony. Except the bad guys computer. Because Sony computers aren't used by bad guys. They were only used by good guys. We don't want our brand associated with bad guys who torture people. We want it associated with Spider-Man. What did you say about Sony? Oh, what do you want? I'm making my review. All I've been hearing you talk about for 20 minutes is Spider-Man. Because the amazing Spider-Man is shit. Sorry. you stop this review right now. Make me. If you stop talking about Spider-Man, you might have the chance to see this.